Um, we've started a new series uh, since Pentecost, just focusing on catching the waves of the Spirit. Uh, my son Joel is a keen surfer. He lives down Phillip Island, and even in the in the depths of winter, if it's a reasonable day and good surf, he'll just jump out in anything. He's always looking for this is the opportunity to just jump out and surf today. It's it's a very powerful thing. Uh, one of the things he's noticed, and you've probably noticed it too, um, you might get a flat day on the bay or around you know, Hastings and beyond, um, but it doesn't stay that way forever. You know, waves eventually always roll themselves back in. And a, key surf, a keen surfer will be up early in the morning, um, down the beach as early as they can, watching and waiting. They've already done the weather report. They've already looked at the surf report. And they just wait for those waves to come in and then they're ready to move. I think church is a lot like that. Being a Christian in community is a lot like that. Sometimes you might wonder, what is God doing? What's God up to? I can't see where it's all going. It used to be so amazing once upon a time when. Uh, the whole thing is, is that uh, the Spirit's waves have not finished yet. And every day they are moving through. And sometimes you'll catch them. You'll catch a wave in the supermarket. You'll catch a wave talking to someone at a school drop-off. You'll catch a wave talking to someone in the op shop. You'll catch the wave when you're spending time with family and suddenly it occurs to you there's a prayer that needs to be prayed. There's a word that needs to be spoken. There's a kindness that needs to be shared. There's something deeper in the conversation than just talking about the footy and what we did last weekend. There's something I sense that God is doing. So that's this season thinking about those ongoing waves and be ready to catch them as they begin to roll their way through. I often think it's a bit like you know dropping a pebble into a still lake and watching those ripples begin to move out. Um, you're part of a ripple that started a long, long, long time ago in the mind of God. You're part of a ripple that flows from Calvary and from a tomb that's emptied from the risen Lord, from the glorification of Christ from those brothers and sisters you know, thousands of years ago who picked up the wave of the Spirit and wrote things down and began to preach and to lead and transform communities, to rescue babies from sewers and the sides of rivers. Now that's our inheritance to move through. Men, women, young, old, Greek, Indonesian, <laughs> it doesn't matter where people are from. When that Spirit is caught and that, whip and that ripple is understood, new things happen. So Judy, I know you were keen before to jump up. Can you come and, and bring us now the, a reading from Acts, which is really the reminder of a wave and that ripple that's moving through. Thanks, Judy. Morning again. The reading is from Acts chapter 8, <coughs> excuse me, 26 to 40, um, and it's Philip and the Ethiopian. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official of all the treasury of the Kondaka, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage the script of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away 
and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and travelled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Rob, would you like to come and um, share with us this morning? Uh, I'm going to just pray for you before um, you launch off today too. It'd be good to do that. So some of you might have met uh, Rob before, and if you haven't, this is Rob. Uh, Peter him earlier. Uh, welcome today, Rob. It's good to see you. Um, one of the things I love about Rob is that um, when you meet him and talk with him, you become aware that actually he is connected with a whole bunch of churches in our movement, from country areas into city areas, from church plants to churches that are thriving in their thousands in community as well. It's a big world, and it's a very diverse and moving and changing world. So that's one of the benefits of having Rob in the room. It's kind of like having a tendril connection with the bigger and fast spread parts of the... You may not know that, Rob, but you are, and we're relying on that. But with Rob, you know, he... He brings a lot and he observes a lot and understands a lot of what's happening in the churches around us in what has been uh, incredibly changing times, even before COVID. Changing times and the last couple of years really challenging. And where we are now, it feels normal. It's not. And some of you will know that really well for a whole bunch of reasons, not just COVID reasons. It is a jumping, shaking, changing world of new forms and new things, not all of it bad, but, you know, to keep it in frame, it's not always easy. So I'm going to pray for you and look forward to what you bring as you kind of like the, um, the, the neuron hub for Churches of Christ this morning. Let's pray. Lord God, we want to thank you um, for Rob. We thank you, Lord, for his journey of faith. We thank you for the churches that he's um, been in key areas of leadership within over time. And Lord, we thank you for his calling for the particular role he has with Churches of Christ in Victoria and Tasmania and the influence of that around the nation as well. So Lord, we just pray for a blessing on him as you work within what he thinks he's prepared for today with those things that you might even change or draw to his mind as he begins um, to become um, a friend to us and a connection with us with the larger world of this movement of Churches of Christ. So Lord, bless him today. We pray in Jesus' name and bless our ears to hear. Amen. Well, it is a great pleasure to be here and to see some of you again and some for the first time. And uh, I count it a great privilege too to serve this movement of the Churches of Christ across Victoria and Tasmania, to have connections nationally and also with churches from other movements. For many years I passed at a local church and it was exciting when it was growing. It was always challenging when it wasn't. And sometimes our own emotions get caught up with what we do. Is that true? And we feel a little bit passionate about the things that we commit to, the things we're invested in. And yet sometimes that passion can take us to places of unhealthy identity. And uh, I know that there have been many occasions since first becoming a Christian at the age of 16 where God has had to humble me. God has had to show me again and again that it is not all about me. It's not all dependent on me, but it is dependent on me in partnership with Jesus. And this morning, I'm excited to talk about this passage of Scripture and to help you journey through that theme of what it means to depend on God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What it means to not just have a religion, but a relationship. What it means whether you are a minister, a leader, just a volunteer, somebody turning up to church on Sunday, to know that you know what God's power in your life is meant to look like. I think for me, when I was 16, would never have imagined that God could use me in leadership. Though I desperately wanted to be used, I struggled with my identity and self-image. I had concerns about what other people would think of me, whether I was going to be good enough, whether I could make a difference. When I realised that it was about yielding myself to God again and again, asking for a fresh touch of the Spirit again and again, needing His power again and again, it became more about filling up the tank so that God could take the car of my life where He wanted to drive. I needed to get out of the driver's seat, get into the passenger seat. Has anybody else perhaps been on a journey like that over the years? You know, it's no accident that you're here in this place part of God's call on your life, that he's brought you here, not just today, but on the journey of your spiritual growth, 
not to make Sunday an end point, but more of a rallying point, a place where you meet with other like-minded people and you climb back in the saddle and continue making a difference. I believe we have to keep coming back to the point of realisation that our best days are yet ahead of us. And we can look into the past, we can look at what once worked, we can look with some disdain at people who have maybe deprived us of opportunities. We can feel upset, maybe even at God, that things haven't worked out as we might have expected. But is it really about us? Is it really about what we want to do? Is it really about what we think should happen? Or is it about in the place of humility, coming back to Jesus, putting our hand in his, and saying, Lord, I know that you're not finished with me yet. As we look at this passage today from Acts chapter 8, we're studying an example of somebody who's what we might call an evangelist, one who shares the good news. It's a ministry gift in the Bible. And it's very easy to check out sometimes and say, well, evangelism is for the specialists, like Philip. Bringing the good news of Jesus is something I can do. But again, let's not make it about our insecurities or the identity that we have bought into for ourselves. You know, Paul says to the Corinthian church to earnestly desire spiritual gifts. So what right would we have to say, I don't have a gift if I've never earnestly desired it? How would you know whether you have a gift or not if you never even sought to exercise the gift? And isn't it true that the Bible calls all of us to share our faith? We're all on the mission that Jesus gave to the early church and he passes the baton to us and effectively says, don't look at what you can't do, look at what you can do. Maybe some earnest desire needs to come back, some fire in the belly. As we ask God again, while there is breath in my lungs, Lord, would you build your church through me? While there is still life flowing through my veins, Lord, would I honour the gift of life that you've given me? As I put myself in your hands again, would you use me again tomorrow and the next day? So when I first came to the Churches of Christ family, off the back of years of serving and leading in churches, I came hopefully with enough humility to recognise that God uses people differently in different families and in different seasons. It was a whole new opportunity for me to lend myself to God's program through local churches like this one. And you are lent into the life of a local church to be used hand in hand with Jesus Christ to continue making a difference. I said to churches when I first arrived that I kind of like the analogy of soccer. Many people watched Australia qualify for the World Cup. Was that a bit exciting? Or maybe not. I see a Wallabies fan and See people caught up with um, the AFL at the moment, which I can be because I'm a Collingwood supporter. Is that all right or should I leave now? <laughs> well, we like all sorts of different sports and pastimes and hobbies. We have interests in all sorts of things. And we can draw from all of those. Look for little glimpses of how God might lead us in them. You look at a soccer pitch and all the players running around. And isn't it interesting that the coach guides them through a strategy and has them play in all different parts of the ground, but they're bound by the guidelines. They can't run up into the grandstands or down the street and still be presuming to play the game of soccer. We do have lines and limits and the safeguards of perhaps being in a church like this submitting ourselves to leaders and mentors to speak into our life and of course yielding to the priority of scripture and the truth that it proclaims our mission is not about something other than the truth or other than the gospel and so it's very clear and yet there's a lot of grass to run around on we have different gifts different local churches have different strategies and priorities about how they reach the end goal. And when you get to the end goal, you've actually got to put the ball into the back of the net and register a score on the board if you're going to be successful. 
So for all of us, let's be clear, the mission of God puts the score on the board as people's lives are impacted with the gospel. And so I want to ask you if today you are saying yes to partnering with Jesus, if we're to draw some examples from the life of Philip and be inspired about how we can find the Ethiopians of our society, as it were, the people who need Jesus, who need us to speak into their lives and to inspire and affirm that God has a plan for their lives, then isn't it true that at some point we will be hoping and aspiring for the score to go up on the board as those people also get baptised and commit their lives to Christ? And there are different reactions we can have to that sense of mission. One is, well, I'm not the guy who puts the ball in the back of the net. I play defence. Yet all of us are advancing the ball. All of us are partnering together. And let's look at what it is that we can do, not at what we can't. Many people's aversion to sharing their faith, if we're honest, it's born by fear. The fear of speaking up, of speaking out. The fear of what it is that will happen if somebody shouts at me. Somebody spurns what I say. Somebody turns their back on me if I lose friends. And it's very natural for us to think about those things and to worry about the implications of serving Christ. But we live in a free country where it's also pretty easy to climb back into the saddle. And it hasn't always been easy for me, and it isn't always easy for you, but really it is quite easy to look at what we can do and to be on the front foot, but to never get too far ahead of ourselves, never to make it about ourselves, unless it is ourselves hand in hand with Jesus. When I first tried to share my faith, because I had met Jesus at 16, I'd accepted that I could not earn my salvation, I couldn't earn favour with God, I needed him. I accepted that Jesus, who knew no sin, could become sin in my place, as 2 Corinthians 5.21 says. He could die for me, and because he conquered death and hell, as he rose from the grave... He gave me the opportunity to partner with him in enjoying this victory over death that now propelled me into his mission. So I was enthusiastic and I went and bought a bunch of those little gospel tracts to tell people about Jesus with my own money as a poor student and I put them into a lot of letterboxes. And I thought at the time, gee, this is easy, I don't even have to open my mouth because I was really intimidated. And it was almost as if God's nudge as I was praying was, that's a great start, but there's more. And then I did try and share my faith and somebody did yell at me and somebody else gave me the bird. And they didn't want to talk to me about Jesus. They thought I was a nutter. Now, being a Collingwood supporter, I might seem like I am, but I have got all my teeth intact. <laughs> and back then, I had to step out of my comfort zone and be willing to talk and I made mistakes. There were curly questions I couldn't answer. So I had to go back and do some research. And I'd go back to some of those people if they would listen. So you know that conversation we had the other day? And I got to a point where as a university student, having been a Christian for a few years, I was starting to talk more and more with friends about their need for faith. And a guy said, well, I've been going to church all my life. I said, but do you know Jesus personally? And we got him to a point through an intellectual obstacle he had and through conversation and then praying about it, of seeing what God would do. And he committed his life to Christ. There was another young man, a Cambodian Buddhist, who said, I respect Jesus, but I'm a Buddhist. And we got to talking and he was prepared to accept Jesus, but only to add him to his Buddhism. And when I plucked up enough courage to dare to suggest that Jesus said he was the only way, truth and life, that people could only come to faith through him. I made the pitch, I sowed the seed, but the Holy Spirit had to water it. And so this young man, as he talked with me fairly openly, I would pray fervently. We got to a point one day just before a lecture was about to start in our university classroom, he said, I'm ready. 
looking at my watch, lecturer is about to start. What do you mean you're ready for the lesson? No, no. He says, I'm ready to accept Jesus. I prayed with him in the minutes that I had. I followed him up, helped him integrate into a church. And last I spoke to him a couple of years ago, he was actually pastoring a, a former Buddhist church. Sorry, a, a church of former Buddhists is a better way to say it. People who had also given their lives to Christ, also from a Cambodian background, just like him, because he used the context in which God had sown him. He didn't get ahead of himself. He asked, Lord, how can I make a difference? And he won all these people to faith. Imagine what might have happened if I had not shared my faith. Imagine what might have happened if I'd stepped back and maybe done very little. If I'd given in to my fears. What might have happened if that young man had happily said, I give mental assent to Jesus, but I want to stay a Buddhist. Well, at the very least, he wouldn't have had the impact for eternity through those lives. It wasn't a big church. He was never going to be some rock star preacher, but who'd want that anyway? He was a genuine guy making a difference in the lives of people around him, just like you and I can still do today. If we would say yes to Jesus if we would simply respond to his promptings. So we have a look now at Philip in this story. We've seen as the verses were read to us that there is a little bit of a cultural context that Luke, as the writer of Acts, is spelling out. He talks about this kingdom and it mentions the name uh, Kandaki or however you say that. Some Bibles say Candace. It wasn't a particular person, it was the office of queen. The queen of this empire of the Ethiopians, which wasn't Ethiopia today, it was considered all of Africa, south of Egypt. So it was a distant land. It was a land with a different culture. And undoubtedly, this particular representative of the queen was wealthy. He looked after her money. He had enough wealth to ride in a chariot. And he probably had dark skin and different customs that would have presented Philip with a bit of a challenge. He could have responded and said, I don't think I'm best suited to sharing the gospel with somebody from a different culture, just like I could have done with my young Cambodian friend. And it's not about racism. It's about the discomfort that we sometimes feel if we don't know what to do. And Philip, interestingly, in verse 29 he responds to the prompting of the Spirit to go up to the chariot. Some of us need to go up to the person and where they're at. And it's a very important principle in this verse, which is that if we are to serve God, we do not do that only in the comfort of our own homes, but of course we do in our homes read the Bible and pray. What we need to be willing to do is, as praying people who are conditioned by the scriptures, the sidelines of the soccer pitch, to be given our marching orders, our strategy, the inspiration of God as we read the text, who as the coach, and maybe through the coach of the local church, like your pastor, who's done such a wonderful job in leading this church, and I want to honour him and acknowledge the key role that he plays. But as strategy is given, even on your knees, hearing from God as you read scripture, there's the opportunity to walk out the door and disconnect your faith from your everyday life. There's also the opportunity to listen to what God says as you're reading, to the nudge that he gives through the day because you're a spiritual person plugged into the power source of heaven. And it might be that the spirit says to you, go up to them just like he did to Philip. And then you realize, I'm not necessarily the super gifted evangelist. I'm just a responsible average Christian who's responding to the Spirit's prompting. And guess what? We can all do it. There was a church that I visited a few years ago, and the youngest person in the congregation would have been in their 60s. So I was being told that it was very difficult for this group to set up for Sundays 
and they simply couldn't do anything beyond Sundays. They were too old, it was too hard, they were too tired, they were too weak. There were all sorts of excuses, to be honest, in a very nice, pleasant conversation, but one with a tone was for people to excuse themselves from the mission God had given them. Now, I wanted to be affirming of the many good things they were doing, of course, but to also just speak to them with a gentle challenge about thinking about what they could do. How might the Spirit prompt you? They were saying they were reading the Bible, they were praying, they would hear from God. I said, okay, if you hear from him, I would suggest to you that the Spirit is very interested in speaking to you about serving and to ask yourself, how could I break free from the limitations and be listening to what the Spirit might say about particular people. I said, for example, what you can do, rather than what you can't do, is to speak to people, yes? And they agreed they could do that. So you can share your faith, is that right? Yes, we can do that. You do have a story about your own encounter with God and answers to prayer that could show someone who's not coming to church what God could be like in their life. And they agreed that was all possible. And you know what? They started to do it. And you know what? Pretty quickly, there were some people that were coming to church. And pretty quickly, despite a COVID lockdown, in part of that little window, there were three people who they were getting ready to baptise. That's pretty exciting. Because it moves from a place of I can't or we can't to there's actually a lot we really can do. When we listen to the Spirit's promptings and he says, go up to that chariot or that coffee table in that shopping centre to that family member who maybe you haven't been speaking much to for a little while. Maybe a family member who's younger than you or different to you who might not have a, an ethnic cultural difference but a social cultural difference. Maybe they're not in your world. But you know, we can all talk, we can all tell our story, and importantly, we can all listen to what people are saying to us. And whether we feel we can pray with them or just for them, we can certainly go home and pray like crazy. What could it look like if on our watch we took some responsibility to be inspired by Philip rather than being intimidated by him? What could it look like if we stepped out of our comfort zone and we just did what we can do, knowing that, yes, we might cop a rebuke, we mightn't win them all, they may not all come to faith, but imagine what would happen if we stretched ourselves and just one or two did. And what if the one or two themselves became like a young Cambodian who decided to pastor his friends? and win them to faith. Imagine the score going up on the board, not as we only kick the ball and even try and take a shot, but actually put the ball into the back of the net. Moving on to verse 35 in this story, as Philip engages in the conversation, he's engaging with somebody around what he's reading. And this is another important principle that if God is already doing something in a person's life, a person's already receptive to spiritual things, they're already having a conversation about the things of God, it can become very easy to just step in and take the conversation a step further. Of course, it's not always like that. But if you look to see what God is already doing in people's lives, then seize every available opportunity to swing the conversation, to tell your story, do it sensitively. But imagine if you could share your faith with a person and it could lead them to faith. What that needs is for you to take advantage of the opportunity that God gives you. So what Philip had to do was to listen to the story. It came from Isaiah 53. It was a passage prophesying the coming of Jesus. The coming of Jesus who would heal and save, who would make a profound difference at some time in the future. But that time had now come and gone. 
And Philip is saying, this prophecy has been fulfilled. He talks to him about Jesus. He helps to turn the lights on. Now, this Ethiopian would, to all intents and purposes, have looked in our modern world like a person of faith already. He was going to a worship service. He was reading from the scriptures. Many of us are sadly content to leave people in that place and say, oh, well, they're on a journey. I don't want to push them. But if we're honest, is it not fear again that's stopping us from helping take the, them through to that next step? It may not be. But I just wonder if at times we talk ourselves out of what we can do rather than seize the moment. So, as I was developing my faith and trying to talk to people, I think of one friend and I told him about Jesus and he snarled at me a little bit. He apologised the next day and we got on okay. But to be honest, I backed off. And I thought, well, he's not ready. He's not interested. He doesn't want it. What I should have done was to stay in purposeful conversation with him and not just make small talk. What I should have done is gone home and prayed a bit more fervently. But I would never have got to sharing my faith with that Cambodian or that other person from a different ethnic background who came to faith. I would never have gone on to the ministry roles that I've had and led people to faith in the future if I'd not learned from that moment. And so building momentum in what you can do is critically important. And building spiritual momentum in others is important too. Leading them not just to talk about the things of faith, but to also acknowledge their need for Jesus. To take them to the place where they accept that obedience to Christ means needing to be baptised. And then it's exercising gifts and helping them see it's something they can do too. It is a great privilege. Finally, the passage goes to verse 40. And we see that Philip, after he's finished sharing his faith, and he's baptised the Ethiopian, he is then caught away. Now, people argue about what that means. Was it a supernatural miracle where he just vanished and was instantly transported to a different geographical location? Well, I'm sure with all the miracles in the Bible, we can believe God could do that. But whether he did or he didn't, it's probably beside the point. Because what did happen was that Philip was called away to another region because he needed to share his faith there too. He was called to Azotus, which was in the region of the Philistines of the Old Testament. We know about the Philistines because of the famous story of David slaying Goliath. But the name Azotus means stronghold. And I wonder if it's not a bit symbolic sometimes of some of the next steps that we are afraid to take that become like a stronghold of the mind where we're imprisoned with thoughts of what we can't do when all the while the Spirit of God is prompting us to break free to cut loose, hand in hand with him, to engage with his power and see what can yet be done. You might not believe about spiritual gifts, for example, that you could exercise the gift of healing. But imagine if you prayed for sick people and dared to believe God would make them well. Maybe only one ever gets healed. That could be better than none. And it might be that a particular person is sick and the particular opportunity has you not just praying a prayer of empathy, but praying a prayer of faith and daring to believe that God would want to move through this miraculous moment, maybe even bring a healing to get their attention. I can think of plenty of times where as I've prayed for people, it's those far from God or who are new Christians who typically tend to be more likely to be miraculously healed. I think of a discouraged older woman who, as I prayed for, she straightened up in my hands from hunched over to standing erect with tears streaming down her cheeks because she was suddenly free of pain. I can think of other times where I've prayed for people for conditions that they'd put up with and the opportunity to pray just came out of a conversation that showed that they were willing to believe in God 
They just needed someone to show them what the next step could look like. And of course I've prayed for people and not seen them healed. But if you're sensitive and you do show empathy in the way you talk, people will often give you that next step. And if they don't, so what? As you build momentum, there will be your next Azotus to go and visit. There'll always be another opportunity. But often those opportunities come connected with strongholds of the mind about what you can't do. And I believe God might want to be wanting to get the attention of some people here today to accept that what we have limited ourselves to has been a limit on what God wants to do in people who still need him. What we've limited ourselves to by saying, I can only do this or that, has somehow deprived us of opportunities to step out in faith and grow spiritually ourselves. And of course we want to be careful not to presume, not to be somebody we're not, but rather respond to the divine promptings and see what God will do with them. There was a uh, time I was leading a group of ministers in the area in which I live, around Berwick. And they were from all different church backgrounds. They would meet regularly to pray. And on one occasion, the new police inspector in town rang me and asked, could he come and speak to the ministers? He'd heard that we met and he wanted to talk to them about crime and how they could partner together in bringing a bit of leadership to the community to change the culture. I thought, what a perfect opportunity. Fantastic. He said to me later, that as a new police inspector, he really wanted to give people a piece of his mind. He'd do it very professionally, of course, but wondered what on earth we were doing just sitting around praying and having lunch. Well, there's all these problems in the community. He wanted to mobilise us to get out there and do something about it. So he gave us his professional speech and he asked for our ideas, hoped that we would connect with him, and then politely excused himself so we could get on with the rest of our meeting. And I felt this prompting of the Spirit in a way and with an opportunity that was new for me. I thought, I haven't connected with a police inspector before. Am I being a bit disrespectful? I just said to him, well, before you go, could I ask you just to stay for a moment longer so that we can pray for you? That's not too hard, is it? It's not too intimidating. It was about all I thought I could manage on the spur of the moment. By simply responding to that prompting and asking him to stay, and of course he said yes, received the prayer, walked out the door, I was opening his life up to what God was going to do next. He cried all the way back to the station. You see, I didn't know at the time, he was thinking a lot about where his life was headed, about what his life stood for, about how it is that he hadn't made enough of a difference. And he remembered being inspired by a person at the police academy when he'd gone in there, I believe, to do some training. And this person at the police academy said to him, you're always so happy. You're always so easygoing. Nothing ever flusters you. What's the difference? Sitting behind a desk, he pulled open a drawer, lifted out a Bible and says, this book changed my life. That police inspector sat with that for quite some time until that day. He connected the dots, or rather, God connected the dots in him. And as he realised that we also had this same thing, he was willing to connect and to talk. And several of us had the privilege of meeting with him praying with him, leading him to faith. I remember hugging him as he came out of his baptism tank. First time I've ever hugged a police inspector. And he was wet. And it was exciting because I'd never seen so much happiness in somebody who in his 50s had finally found what he'd been searching for all his life. I wonder if that would have happened if I'd ignored the nudge. I wonder if that would have happened if the stronghold of the mind sapped all the momentum in my spiritual growth and I sat back and said no 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 I can't do it I shouldn't it's disrespectful he's only come to do one thing let him go he's a busy man 
There are plenty of busy people in your life. You're going to see them this week. And there'll be people who on the inside are hurting and they won't tell you straight away. There'll be people in your world who have needs. You might be the only person who could connect them to the one who meets the needs in Jesus Christ. But there's an opportunity you've got this week to think a little differently, to see the stronghold broken down, to yield to the moving of the Spirit on and through you. It's an opportunity you've got this week to allow God to change the agenda of some other people's lives, to get their attention and to do something significant. There's an opportunity some of you are going to have this week to pray for somebody who's sick or in pain and to dare to believe in that moment that God is going to work through you. But there's an opportunity you all have as you leave this place and go home to lift your game if that's what you need to do. To step out of your comfort zone and make some decisions about what that's going to look like. To read the Bible daily and pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to you from it if that's not part of your routine. And if you are praying for five minutes, to lift it to ten. There is something we can all do as a response to today. But I just wonder if the choices we make and the fruit and harvest that we reap in the months and years to come might trace back to this day where you heard from the Spirit through a visiting speaker in whose words there was a bit of a nudge. I wonder if that nudge is prompting something in you. Not a religious duty of reading the Bible, of turning up to church, as good as all those things are, but to move from the context of your religion to a relationship that is fresh and alive so that you draw inspiration from Philip, not condemnation, so that you look at what you can do and not what you can't do, so that you look at people from different backgrounds like the Ethiopian and not always from the same one, that you look to people irrespective of their age group or their need or what intimidates you and you say, I am God's change agent to my world and I'm going to get over myself and I'm going to step up. Could I ask you to bow your heads, please? I'd like to lead you in prayer. And I just wonder if that's you today and you're feeling that nudge that you might just in this moment of reflection consider what God is asking of you. I want to give you a moment as you reflect to just say in your own words to own what you've been doing that's not been honouring God. To own what you've been doing that's allowed you to be intimidated. To say, Lord, I'm drawing a line in the sand today. I'm crossing over it to the other side. I'm not going to stay in the place of intimidation. I'm not going to stay in the place of slackness or indifference. I'm not just going to be content with what my life has become. I'm not going to believe the deception that my best days are behind me. I'm going to respond to you and Spirit of the living God who just pray for every person here seated in this place, watching this service. Lord, that there would be just a divine convergence right now, that you would move on the hearts of each person. Lord, that you would translate the nudge into action today. I just wonder if you're seated here and you're reflecting on what God is saying, that if in all honesty you might feel that perhaps you're not certain about your faith. You're not certain that you have that relationship with God I've been talking about. Just simply as I'm praying, would you in your own words say, Lord Jesus, I invite you in. I invite you to be Lord of my life, not just my saviour. I invite you to give me that nudge, those next steps as I read your word. Lord, I purpose to commit my life, my heart to you. I thank you that you died in my place. If there are some of you who have been a Christian for a while and the habit of a daily devotion has long since gone out the window, that you'd be saying, Lord, I commit to reading your word. And even if it's just a short passage, even if it's just the New Testament or it's just the gospel, just as you build that momentum day by day, to say, come Holy Spirit, speak to me afresh. Lead and guide me into outworking this truth. 
to speaking into the lives of others. And Lord, I pray for everyone here who needs to encounter you today. Lord, whether it's healing from sickness, whether it's that step up, whether it's partnering with you again, Lord, that this will be the day of consolidation. This will be the moment of new beginnings. This will be a time and the season of opportunity that the people of God would stand on the threshold, look at a great new horizon and say, God, I give you thanks for what you've sown in my life thus far. But I choose to run toward what I see, a future church that is dependent on me, making a difference, hand in hand with you. Lord, I thank you for this wonderful group of people. I thank you for John's many years of faithful commitment, for sowing into the hearts and lives of people here and uh, people who are also not here today. But Lord, that this church's days would also be brighter and even more radiant in the future because of what he's done. Lord, that we would honour the legacy by stepping out of our comfort zone this week. Work through us again, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I cast my mind to Calvary Where Jesus bled and died for me I see His wounds, His hands, His feet My Saviour on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still and all alone oh praise the name of the lord our god Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days I will sing Your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, O oh Lord. shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus face oh praise the name of the Lord our God oh praise his name Forevermore, for endless days, he will sing your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God, O Lord, O Lord our God, O Lord, O Lord our God. Now, um, <coughs> I've cast my eye around the the uh, building this morning and I'm really pleased because I can see that the people who have come this morning who got up in five degree temperatures and came here this morning are the sharpest minds in the church <laughs> and uh, not only are they the sharpest minds but they've got the razor sharp memories so I want you I'm going to put that to the test so I just want you to cast your mind back to 1969 in July 1969, in fact, on the 20th of July 1969. So what happened? What, what, what major event happened on the 20th of July 1969? 
You want to recall? Who, what was it? Man on the moon. And who was that man on the moon? Neil, Neil Armstrong. And when he took his first step on the moon, what did he say? <laughs> he said, one small step for a man. One giant leap for mankind. It's a very controversial statement, actually, because that's what Neil Armstrong claims he said. But what everyone heard was one small step for man. But he said, no, it was one small step for a man. One giant leap for mankind. Now, it's one of those moments where you, you, you remember where you were when you heard it. You know, I can remember, I was a year nine student in high school, and I remember hearing it crackling over the speaker, and, and I thought to myself at that t time, this is a big deal. This is actually a big deal, and it still is. It's still a big deal to go to the moon, right? Um, I don't know if anyone's been to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, but there's a replica of the Apollo 11 spacecraft. Uh, James is nodding. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a structure about the s uh, size of this r half the size of this room and about as high as this ceiling. It looks like someone's just gone down to the local supermarket and bought 200 uh, rolls of alfoil and wrapped it around and said, right, you're good to go, off you go to the moon. Um, the, uh, but but that was that one small step. That one small step changed Neil Armstrong's life forever. That one small step actually changed the course of history. And I was also uh, listening just recently, about a month ago, to the CEO of World Vision, uh, a chap by the name of Daniel Wordsworth, he's an Aussie, and he was uh, talking about when he was, uh, about a month ago, uh, on the border of Ukraine and Moldova. And at that time, he was there assisting the refugees flee their war-torn country. And he spoke about the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of refugees who were taking a 10-metre walk from war-torn Ukraine to the safety and refuge of Moldova. And it struck him at that time that it was that 10-metre walk that was changing those refugees' lives forever. Oh. And the history of refugees, of course, is that once, or well, the, the vast majority of refugees that leave their country, it show, history shows they never return, hardly ever return. So it literally changes lives forever, that, that 10 metre walk. So here we are this morning, and we're invited to come around this table and for some of us, we're going to be invited to take a two or three metre walk. For others, it'll be a bit closer, a couple of steps. But I'd put to you that these few steps that we're taking this morning are the most important steps of our lives because they are the steps that lead us around this table that Jesus invites us to every morning. And the, the, this is the table that invites us to say, well, uh, I'm a sinner. I, I, just, I never get it right, but I'm desperately in need of forgiveness. And if you... I, I, I actually like the fact that we've changed the way we engage in, communi in communion. If you think about pre-COVID, we used to be served communion. With this COVID safe way of accepting communion, we now have to make a decision, don't we? We have to make a decision to actually stand up and travel these few steps to engage in this important uh, ceremony. Now, if you're not actually sure of why you stand up and do this every morning, I would encourage you to think deeply about it. Because for some of us, it can become a bit like a habit. You know, if we've been standing up every morning and coming, coming here every, every week and all we do is, right, we've got to do this and, and let's get it over and done with so we can get on to the next part of the service. But I would encourage you this morning, before you stand up, to consciously challenge yourself and ask yourselves, why am I doing this? What's the purpose of me standing up and coming to take these elements 
which are representations of the sacrifice that was made for me. So I'm going to pray in a moment, but when you're invited to come up, I'd encourage you just to pause for five seconds. Pause for five seconds, reflect in your own time as to why you're doing it. And just check in with yourself. Because for those of us that have been doing it for many, many years, perhaps the genuine meaning of why we're doing this every morning perhaps has become uh, a bit rote. So let us pray. Lord God, how grateful we are for the significance and the transformational power of small steps, particularly those steps that bring us into a deeper and more meaningful relationship with you. We thank you for the steps that you have guided us to take over the course of our lives, steps that have led us to your table this morning. We are so grateful for these symbols of, of body and for blood, symbols that remind us of Jesus' supreme sacrifice on our behalf. Lord, we pray that you will continue to encourage and support everyone this morning who consciously chooses to continue to take those critical small steps, steps that have the power to transform each of our lives, mend our brokenness, uplift our spirits, and allow us to walk humbly with our God. In Jesus' name, amen. So please, just take those five seconds before you stand and you're all invited to come and participate in this redemptive power of what we call communion. And as you're doing so, I remind you that the bag here is for our offerings. Amen.